Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's very nice to see you all here, and welcome to the Redleaf Electric Vehicles Conference. We are delighted to see so many of you here for what I hope will be a fascinating debate and insight into the future of the automotive sector. Today's conference will explore as many different areas as possible, and our speakers will cover topics including autonomous vehicles, battery technology, fuel cells and hydrogen, an investor's viewpoint, charging infrastructure, and the challenges around vehicle electrification. Will we drive or will we be driven? What will we travel in? What are the best options to invest in? Does the UK have the right infrastructure? Can we meet the challenges ahead? These are just some of the questions that I hope we can answer today. I'm sure you will have many more, and there will be the chance to ask each presenter in turn after they have presented their slides. Last week, The Guardian reported sales of electric cars in the UK have risen 11% from last year, making us a leading country in the transfer away from petrol and diesel vehicles, though we still lag behind Norway and China. In Norway, these vehicles are run almost exclusively off the nation's hydropower resource, underlining Norway's claim as a world leader. What we need to now know is how the UK's grid will be able to cope and whether we have the ability to increase capacity to deal with rising demand. Looking at the UK market, e-vehicle sales alone reached 14,084 units in the first quarter of 2018, of which plug-in hybrid vehicles accounted for 71% of those sales. The market share of electric vehicles increased from 1.5% a year ago to 2% today. I will now hand over to our first speaker. Chris Jones is a leading industry analyst and co-founded Canalis almost 20 years ago. He has been focusing on autonomous vehicles analysis since 2016, looking at trends such as driver assistance features to higher levels of autonomy in the vehicles we drive. Chris will now speak about the automotive revolution. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be speaking for the next 20 minutes or so with time for Q&A uh, about the automotive space. So, so much has been changing in this industry over the last few years. It's hard to, to really keep up with it, but as an analyst, as an industry analyst, it's a fascinating market to be covering. Um, a little bit of information about Canalis very quickly. We're an industry analyst company. We cover a number of different technology markets that you can see there uh, with the icons and, and the description underneath. I lead our automotive research practice at Canalis. Uh, I've covered various areas over the last few years, but for the last three years, I cover automotive. We call it intelligent vehicles. So this is where we look at the connectivity, the, the rising levels of autonomy in vehicles, uh, and the future of, uh, of the industry. The ecosystem is changing dramatically. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen the emergence of many different startups in this industry. This is a, a kind of a brief overview of, of how the ecosystem looks, looks today, very much more complex than it ever used to be. The automotive OEMs uh, in the middle there with the component suppliers, uh, the tier one, tier two component suppliers, but then a raft of companies appearing in, in different bubbles around this, this chart um, covering different areas. I won't go through all of these in, in, in turn, but the autonomous vehicle technology and solution providers, the second bubble you see at the top there, there are dozens of these. You know, there are many companies producing autonomous vehicle driving platforms to be used in vehicles over the next few years. They're all chasing to be first. Um, I'll talk about a couple of these, um, you know, during my presentation this morning. But there's a real, um, you know, race to get their platform, their solutions on the road as quickly as they can. Now, there are challenges to that, and we'll talk about those as well. The supply chain is changing as we move to more electric vehicles, as Rafe uh, described. Um, there are app developers, content providers, search engines, and map providers um, heavily involved in this industry. From a connectivity point of view, and I'll have a slide on connectivity a bit later, that brings in another, another group of companies in the mobility space, the mobile operators, and many more. And then la lastly on this side, I'll just talk about the fleet management on-demand car uh, ride-sharing services, which again are becoming much more uh, prominent in this area and the likes of Uber, Lyft, and Didi in China, they want to get rid of the driver from their vehicles. So they all are heavily involved in, in bringing uh, autonomous vehicles to market over the next few years, and we'll talk about that as well. So vehicles will increasingly become autonomous, connected, 
electric and shareable. And I'll be talking about um, each of these one by one. You might have heard about the levels of autonomy uh, defined by the SAE and NHTSA um, as, as the following. F from levels zero to five, with five being the ultimate. You can see from the, from the icons there, the, 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 um, the control that the vehicle has in the running of the vehicle at the top, um, and then the control that the human has with the, with the hands on the steering wheel um, underneath. Level five is the ultimate. Level five is really full driving, full self-driving under any condition, anywhere. So no steering wheel, no pedals, no, hum no driver, no human driver in the vehicle. This is the ultimate. But it means it can go anywhere. And we're many years away from this. Level four, the next level down, will be more of a geofenced situ situation where it might be a lane or two of a motorway. It might be a zone of, of a city. It might be a campus, a university campus. It could be you know, a shopping mall from the car park to the, to the mall itself. So it's controlled. There will be a steering wheel, uh, potentially in this vehicle. That might retract into the, into the dashboard, but there will be the opportunity for the human to drive those vehicles. Those are the kind of vehicles we're seeing being tested around the world. Most of the autonomous vehicle testing um, has been in the US. A lot of the companies you know, come from the US or do their research and development in the US. I spent seven and a half years living in Palo Alto, California, returning to the UK in August of last year, and I was really in the, in the hotbed of the research for autonomous driving. I lived literally half a mile away from the Waymo um, HQ. Waymo is the Google self-driving car project. Their vehicles were parked in a, in a parking uh, garage very close to my house, and I'd see them every day, these Waymo vehicles. Remember the, the small bubble car that you would see um, driving around, but also then the, uh, the minivan that they moved to, the seven-seater, from Chrysler that they moved to. And the exciting news recently was that they'll take 20,000 Jaguar I-PACE vehicles from 2020 uh, with self-driving capabilities. So Waymo is doing things um, in a very you know, methodical way. It's driven more than 5 million miles in, in autonomous mode in about 20 cities in the US. Now, mostly these are fairly safe environments. If you know the Bay Area, and you might know Palo Alto or Mountain View, big wide streets, fairly quiet, um, not, not, not too much happening on the road. So they've done a lot of testing in that kind of environment, also in Phoenix, Arizona, Kirkland uh, near Seattle, and a few other cities that they've more recently moved into. It's building things up um, yeah, and has done for many years. Now, Waymo won't build its own cars, as you're seeing from some of the announcements with Jaguar, with Fiat Chrysler, and others going forward they will you know, take vehicles from automotive OEMs. And that will become much more of a, um, much more of a strategy for the OEMs as well. Uh, we're seeing Uber placed an order for, for um, a number of Volvo SUVs last year. Um, so that will become, not the norm, but that will become a big part of the automotive OEMs business, selling to fleet owners, including those ride-sharing companies that we're, that we're familiar with. A couple of accidents have made the news, unfortunately. You know, it's front page global news when something happens involving an, an autonomous vehicle. The Tesla involved in the recent accident, again, literally less than a mile away from where I used to live. I know this stretch of the 101 motorway very well. It's a complicated stretch of motorway, lots of very short exits, um, old lines, new lines, um, the road's in quite bad condition. The, 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 the area where the vehicle um, went into the central reservation, there's a, a complicated uh, express lane exit going off to the left. Remember, we're driving on the right side, off to the left with an exit on the right. Pr pretty complicated si situation. But it's a road that Teslas and other autonomous vehicles have driven many, many times. Now, the driver in, involved in that had had his hands off the steering wheel for too long, was, was being alerted, ignored those alerts, and the accident happened. Now, Tesla is, is upsetting the regulators, the authorities, because it's released that information very early. They need to investigate the whole situation. So there's a lot more we'll hear from that. But it does put the industry back. You know, it's like two step, you know, one step forward and two steps back when something like that happens. And then the Uber incident. Now, that was a test, an, a test engineer. You've probably seen the video, quite a shocking video. But again, that was a, that was a, a test vehicle. And again, it, 
reduces one's trust in this technology when something like this happens. And Uber and Tesla are two very disruptive companies, two aggressive companies who are really trying to you know, shake up this industry. And it's an industry that needs shaking up. Um, and you know, it has been affected by these two companies greatly in the last few years. But unfortunately, these events have, have happened with these two companies. Um, and then the next thing to talk about is, is, is China and the companies from China who, again, see this as a race. Now, that's worrying to us and I think worrying to the industry that a company like uh, Baidu, which is basically the, the Google of China, again, they've got a very aggressive plan to bring autonomous vehicles into the Chinese market. And they will try and do things as fast as they can. In the Uber incident, it had, a, had the, had the well-known Velodyne spinning LiDAR on the top of the vehicle. Now, Velodyne are pointing the finger at Uber. They're saying, well, it's the software. It's not our, not our LiDAR. Our LiDAR would have picked that up. It's how the software processed that information that is, that is at fault. Very complicated, lots to, you know, lots to talk about. It, it has, we believe, set the industry back. Now, many of the major automotive OEMs have laid out their plans for when they intend to bring vehicles of higher levels of autonomy to market in the coming years. Now, this is a bit of a moving target. And you know, the incidents in the last few weeks will really have companies thinking hard about whether they still bring the vehicles of that certain level of autonomy to market when they claim that they will do that. You see here in, in the colors, levels one to four, we believe level five will be beyond this time period. I just kept it to the to the next few years. It's very hard to forecast this market, as you can imagine. But Audi um, is the first to have announced a level three vehicle coming to market. We think, and they can't do that until it's regulated and until the authorities say, yes, you can do this. Because level three, if you remember from the previous slides, relies on handover from vehicle to human. What will the human be doing when the vehicle needs the human to take over? That is the big uh, question in the industry as to how one handles the handover. And that really scares the industry. So level three, um, which will be a mix, is, an, is a level that many will skip over, as you can see from, this, from the colors on this slide. Many will attempt to go to level four, uh, more of a geofenced area that the vehicle will have the ability to drive itself with human, human intervention when, when the human wants to, rather than when the vehicle needs it to. But we're some way off from that. So it might be that Audi, with the Audi A8 that they announced last year, um, will not have that level three capability. They, will, they might decide to hold off on that because of some of the challenges that other vendors have seen and the trust uh, that people have in this technology. The Audi A8, which is the one that will have this level three capability, is a very small part of their business. The Audi A8, as you know, is a, is a, is a premium, um, you know, luxury um, saloon, let's say, but it's less than 2% of Audi's sales. So even if it does come to market with level three, it will be a, you know, a certain trim level, so the volumes will be very small. I put Tesla on there as well um, in gray for 2018, and it's likely to keep on you know, increasing the capabilities of autopilot um, gradually with over-the-air updates, which it's been famous for over the last few years. But again, you know, the incident of a few weeks ago might set that back as well for some, some time. The others are fairly mixed. Now, what does it mean when a company says, right, we will launch a level four vehicle in 2021? It might be one model, one market, a limited production of that particular vehicle. So although they're putting their stake in the ground, it's often around a big, you know, a big event in the industry, um, you know, a big car show, maybe the consumer electronics show in Vegas every year, where companies are going out there, they're making announcements, they're getting the press, they're getting the marketing. But what's really behind that announcement? That's the, the, the kind of thing that we have to look into and really try to understand. But it might be a fairly limited um, plan or limited volume that they really um, intend to bring to market at that particular point in time. But again, it really comes down to regulation. How are the authorities regulating this, you know, the industry regulating these vehicles? And then trust. In reality, even level one capabilities, something like ad adaptive cruise control, where the vehicle can be set to, to a certain distance from the car in front, and the vehicle will do the braking and the acceleration to keep at that same distance. Only about 10% uh, in, in Europe and about 20% of vehicles sell with that feature today, which means that most of us have never used adaptive cruise control. 
or lane keep assist, which would give a gentle nudge of the, of the steering wheel back into the center of the lane. Most of us have never used that technology, let alone put all our trust in the vehicle to take control of, of the driving for us. You know, how many of us would put our child or our a relative in one of these vehicles and send them off to school? Not many, I don't think, today. So there's a long way to go in this industry. On the right here, I talk about robo-taxis. So this would be a, a ride-sharing vehicle um, that is so, a self-driven ride-sharing vehicle. So Uber or Lyft or DD taking the driver out of the, out of the situation. Now, many of the OEMs are planning for this to be their trial, their first uh, deployment of these vehicles in a small um, you know, sort of trial, maybe 20 or 50 vehicles in a particular city that is very controlled as to how it's, how it's rolled out. GM, Ford, VW, BMW, Mercedes, many of the OEMs are talking about launching these vehicles first in that kind of fleet. So small volumes, uh, controlled situations, kind of trials with the public to get the public familiar and trusting in this, in, in this technology. But it, again, the Uber incident, again, you know, one step forward, two steps back. So it's been, uh, it's going to be quite a challenge. It might be that Uber um, gives up on its own autonomous vehicle software platform design, and maybe they'll end up going with someone else. That could be Waymo. So someone like Waymo, Google, could be the winner in this because it's, got, it's been very methodical in how it's been rolling out, doing a lot of testing, a lot of miles driven in simulation, a lot of miles driven in proving grounds where they might design a, a, a kind of fake city in, a, in, an old, in, a, in an old airfield or something like that. And a lot of miles are driven in these kind of scenarios, whereas Uber and others are trying to really rush this technology to market. Connectivity, we're seeing more connectivity come into vehicles. Um, connectivity to the outside world, and connectivity within the vehicle. On the, on the left side, connectivity to improve the on-road experience for the vehicles to be integrated more into smart cities as they, as they develop over the coming years. Cellular V2X, so vehicle to everything connectivity, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to road infrastructure, vehicle to person, vehicle to individual. Um, th that is increasingly becoming um, uh, in the plans of many of the, many of the OEMs. There's a technology called DSRC, which is a, a kind of a car-to-car -car technology, which only really is available in, in a few cars. But cellular V2X seems to be the way that the industry will probably go. That will in, uh, mean using the, using the phone networks and communication between cars, communication between cars and road infrastructures like traffic lights or, or the like, which means that the cars will know when the lights are about to change. The cars will know where other cars are approaching that intersection. They can slow down or speed up accordingly. Uh, and many different examples of, of how cellular V2X and V2X generally can be, can be used. Um, more connectivity with collaborative driving. So again, you know, cars or vehicles will be able to collaborate and, and know where the others are going, know what speed they're driving. Over the F software updates, which Tesla really brought to market, will have to be deployed by many more companies. Remember, these you know, vehicles in, in the past have been designed to last for 10 to 15 years. As we move to more shared vehicles in the future, maybe robo taxis, um, they will be better utilized. They might drive the same number of miles that they've done in, in, a, in 15 years today in two or three years. They might drive 150,000 miles in three years if they're heavily utilized, being driven you know, throughout the day. Um, so over the uh, software updates will be very important to, uh, to in increase the capabilities um, and update the software. And then live traffic and maps, parking and point of interest information. So as you drive into a city, um, you'll know where the parking spaces are. It will be live information. You'll, you'll be able to pay for that on your way into the city. So you approach and even in the future, you'll be able to leave your vehicle outside of the parking lot or the, park, you know, the car park. I'm still talking American a little bit. Um, leave your car outside the car park, um, leave it at the entrance, and it will go and autonomously park itself in a space in the car park. Um, that's coming in the future. And then fleet management. Within the vehicle itself, we'll be better entertained and more productive as we sit in the back of an autonomous vehicle, uh, potentially. Every, every, display, every window, every door, every, every wall within inside the vehicle could be a display in some form. Um, this picture, I think, is from Mercedes where they're having a conference call. 
collaborative, using the, using the doors as screens, etc. So this is a vision of, of one particular OEM. And again, com you know, commerce from the vehicle is very important. But all this needs you know, the ubiquitous connectivity that, we'll, that we expect to get uh, as we move to 5G in the next few years. So some of this is, is really reliant on 5G. But as you know, many, many cars today have a 3G connection or a 4G connection, and this will just keep on going, and, and so every car will be connected in the next few years. Already touched on Tesla a little bit, but we should step back and, and you know, think about how Tesla has um, you know, impacted this industry. It's been very influential in, in, in how OEMs have, have been approaching things, not just the electrification, which we know very well, but electrification with, with a long range. So rather than the 90 or 100 miles that you get in some of the, some of the vehicles today, much longer range, um, building its battery, fa battery factory, um, having that ludicrous mode, which is... Uh, um, you know, kind of an interesting and an exciting thing for the drivers there to have that. The design, you'll see you know, the same kind of sleek design in many other cars now that you wouldn't have seen before. The large touch display and, and the, you know, the human machine interface, um, you know, their design has, has influenced others in how they are now using screens and displays in, within, the, within the vehicle. The over-the-air updates, which means that you know, a Tesla owner can wake up one morning with a new feature, and that's quite exciting for them. Um, Pretty much no other OEM has been able to do this yet, the over-the-air updates, not in the same way that Tesla has. Of course, Autopilot, we've mentioned briefly. There have been fewer updates, really, in Autopilot over the last year than we had in the previous two or three years. So maybe it's kind of slowed down as, as they kind of work out some of, the, some of the challenges there. The direct sales model, a very different you know, go-to-market strategy from Tesla to anyone else. And now others are looking at that same model as well. Um, as maybe they, they you know, look to close showrooms in the future, um, consolidate some of those, and really think about how Tesla has driven demand for its products. Production is another thing, but at least driven demand for its products uh, with its own launch events, a lot, of, a lot of noise around the launch events, taking pre-orders for the cars to build up um, you know, its own forecast as what it needs to produce, taking deposits on, on new vehicles. We're starting to see that from other, other car companies as well now and pretty much no marketing. The production is another issue. Now, it's in production hell, as, as you would have seen Elon uh, talking about over the last few months. Um, very complicated production facilities, overcomplicated, slowing things down even. They've um, you know, shut down their, their, um, their production again last week for the second time this year to kind of catch up and to kind of sort out some of the, some of the challenges that they're having um, with, the, with the Model 3 production. They're way behind. They've got um, you know, dozens, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of orders still, for, still to fulfill for the Model 3. I was in California a couple of weeks ago, and they, you see them on the road now. They're out there. Uh, a few, only a few thousand have been delivered so far, with well over 300,000 people still waiting for their car that they ordered some time ago. So they've got a lot of challenges. But they've done a lot in the industry, and they have impacted a lot of different OEMs in some way over the last few years. They've influenced these companies and many others. Um, but Dieselgate you know, really forced you know, the German OEMs and others to uh, you know, all in on the EV side, which is great news for us and everyone in the room, I hope. Um, they all, all, all three and, and many others, all three of these, these car companies or these groups have a, a broad range of electric vehicles planned from the, from the small compact or, or the small you know, smart car or mini to the, to the SUV and everything in between, urban to luxury, and increasingly with autonomous features in these vehicles. But they're also investing in other areas. Um, from, from one of the earlier slides, uh, they've been investing in, in ride-sharing companies or building their own ride-sharing or car-sharing service. BMW and Mercedes have, have Drive Now and car to go and they're actually merging those two services. You know, you know, it's amazing that BMW and Daimler are kind of actually merging one of their services. And, and this is the car sharing service that they have in many cities around Europe and the US. Um, and, and all these, we believe, will move to, uh, to electric um, and, also, and autonomous uh, going forward. But pretty exciting new, new, new looks and, and new, new cars um, coming from these, these guys often with, with new sub-brands that they're launching to, to really change the, uh, the appeal for these cars. Um, 
a couple of data slides here. Um, as, a, as an analyst firm, we have lots of data. I decided not to use much of my, or any of my own data really today. There's a couple of uh, charts here showing some, some car sales. Um, still only about 2% of car sales are ele or electrical plug-in today. So still a long way to go um, in, in many countries in Europe, in China, US, still around 2%. Norway is the one big exception, as, as, as Rafe uh, described earlier. About 48% now of, of new vehicle registrations in Norway are electric vehicles. So lots of exciting stuff happening around the world. Um, GM with the Chevy Bolt uh, is now the, the leading, the best-selling uh, electric vehicle in the US. This is a compact car. And interesting, interestingly, they are designing with ride-sharing in mind the Chevy Bolt, which is all EV. Um, thin front seats to give more legs, leg room in the back for the passengers. Three seats in the back, a flat floor in the back to again give more space for the, for the traveling passengers of the Lyft or Uber driver who has decided to go with that car. So, you know, this design decisions are being made with autonomy and, and with urban mobility and car sharing in mind. Um, I won't have too much time to go over this slide. It, it shows some of the leading ride sharing companies around the world. DD is the big one in China. Um, SoftBank is a massive investor um, in a lot of these companies, including Uber. But DD has invested in about seven other ride-sharing companies around the world in, in different, different regions and is really building up its capability uh, and, its, and, its, um, and its user base. And think of this beyond just people moving. They'll be delivering goods, or already delivering food and, and delivering other things. So th these vehicles will be moving people and moving things around during the day to keep these vehicles heavily utilized. And then you know, managing the fleet of vehicles is another challenge in itself, which would help those that already own a fleet or manage a fleet. It's a very comple complex scenario to manage a fleet of vehicles in a city, make sure the vehicles are in the right place at the right time of day to, to understand when when that football match is finishing, um, you know, when the, when the nightclubs are, are shutting, you need the vehicles in, in, in the areas where there's going to be people. You need, if, if these vehicles move to electric, then they need to be, they need to be lots, of, lots of charging stations around the city to make sure they're all charged, they're all serviced. And you might have some, um, some lanes of a, of a road that will give dynamic charging to, to give a quick, a quick burst of charge to a vehicle as it moves around the city. So, the whole move to, to robo-taxis, to um, urban mobility services, to have a fleet of these vehicles driving around the city, picking people up, dropping people off, picking things up, dropping things off, need to be managed. And it's very fluid as to how they move around. The movement of one affects the movement of others around them. So very complex, but this is also affecting the automotive industry. O automotive OEMs are really having, having to think about this, so investing in companies that have this expertise, and we'll see it come to... Uh, come to the form you know, in, in the cities that we live in and work in in the coming years. So in summary, as I mentioned, four major disruptions, all arriving really at, you know, at once. And it's, it's how the OEMs and the other companies involved in the industry, the supply chain and everything else, and, and the consumer's perception and consumer's trust and acceptance of this um, is, is fascinating as, as an analyst company to kind of follow this space because you've got so much disruption happening in the industry, so much innovation happening after years of pretty stable automotive and pretty comfortable situations for the automotive OEMs. There's a lot of these disruptions now really impacting the strategies of the major OEMs. And some of the big ones will fail. There are you know, a lot of big OEMs out there, um, but in some markets, the car sales are down. You see the car sales down in mature markets like the UK, like the US and others. China only about 2 or 3% growth in 2017 after a very strong 2016. So things are changing. So you know, everyone in the industry needs to adapt to that and, uh, and, and bring these kind of uh, um, innovations and, and technologies into their, into their strategy. So we've got, we've got about five, six minutes for questions. Okay. Yes, at the front, yes, please. Um, detect a pool of water, a bag of nails, or a pothole that a human would avoid? Great question. Um, through deep learning, you know, all the possible things that a vehicle will need to identify and drive through, drive over, drive around, need to be, you know, kind of input into a big, you know, a big kind of database, and the vehicle needs to learn what to do in different scenarios. If you think about 
the strangest thing that you've seen on a motorway that's happened to you whilst you've been driving, that long tail of things that could happen, all those instances need to be experienced by the vehicle. It needs to know whether it can drive through that pool of water, drive over that paper bag, or, or whether it needs to stop or go around it. So it, it has to be done through training, training the system. Um, NVIDIA has suddenly become a massive company in this space because of its GPU and how the GPU is processing you know, millions of sets of data, millions of pictures, millions of you know, you know, bits of information to, to help train vehicles. So they need to be trained. And if they don't experience that on the road, then they need to be, they need to be trained through simulation. So it's, it's identifying what these look like, but there'll always be that, that strange thing that happens. I was driving near LA one time and a bike fell off the back of a vehicle. It had been on, on the bike rack at the back. It fell off the vehicle and was traveling up the, up the freeway towards me at about, you know, I was going 70 miles an hour. How can you train a vehicle to, to understand what to do when a, when a bike has, you know, is, is coming towards you? You know, you have to move around it, but there'll be times when the vehicle will stop and not know what to do. So all the systems need to train to train a vehicle to understand what to do in every circumstance. There's another question here. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike friend. Um, morning, Chris. Um, do you see there being any political problems um, with with this revolution coming along, given that how many people will become unemployed, uh, currently employed in the industry? Do you see any governments actively slowing down the process of uh, adoption of technology in the coming years? Thank you. Uh, another great question, a very complex one, and, and it's very different, you know, state to state in the US, country to country, city to city. Um, not, not much has been laid out yet. Um, there is this, this concern about jobs lost, but jobs will be gained as well in different areas. So, you know, these vehicles will need to be serviced. Um, they're not going to service themselves. There will be opportunities for, um, for those, you know, to, to, to kind of move into those kind of areas. We, we, we've seen disruption and transition from industries in the past, and, and some have gone away, but some have survived. In, in some cities around the world, there's really a, a, you know, a lack of drivers. There's a lack of truck drivers. There's a lack of, it, it, lack, lack of taxi drivers and bus drivers in, in, in places like Singapore. So they're, they're happy to replace those, those vehicles with, uh, with humans who don't want to do those jobs in some cases. So truck drivers and trucking is another space where autonomy will come in. But yeah, I mean, that will be an inevitability, but there will be other opportunities to um, you know, to create new jobs through through this. Yeah, um, if if autonomous driving is so dependent on satellite navigation, four G, five G, what commitment is there from telecoms companies to actually have um, a full coverage of four or five G? I mean, today even coming into London, I've got three G, no G, four G. <laughs> it's all over the bloody place. Yeah, yeah. So what? commitment is there from that that's frankly one of the most important parts of the of the uh of, of joining the circle isn't it and it without is that you've got yeah. nothing right so it is what commitment have they given to um to this process of auto autonomous driving yeah it is an important part but it you know these vehicles can operate without without them but yeah we're, we're a long way from that we're a long way from that ubiquitous connectivity from that your blanket of coverage you're right even even in the UK and other mature markets, there are still pocket, you know, still areas where you you lose that signal. And you know, you're coming up to that stretch of road, you know you're going to lose that signal, and then you then you know you're going to get it again. So still not blanket coverage in a country like the UK, let alone the rest of the world. So there's some way behind in that. Um, 5G will come in the next few years, but cars will be able to drive themselves. It's really the sensors and it's it's understanding their their environment, knowing where they are on the road, knowing where they should be on the road. And the sensors, the LIDAR, the radar, the cameras, the sonar will be enough to get them from A to B. Uh, they just need to understand you know, the environment around them. The connectivity to the, to the cloud and to the, to the phone networks is, is another thing for the connectivity piece. But for the driving itself, you know, the, the suite of sensors um, you know, should be good enough for the, for the time being. But again, we're some years out from that as well. Uh, there's one last question at the back. Yes, it's not the... Um it's not the training of the car, it's the impediment in terms of the processing speed of the geospatial awareness and the vehicle going down the street and making sure that it doesn't bump into either a human or a, a um, <clears throat> bicycle or whatever around him. And the faster you go, the higher the processing speed and the greater the response and the faster response you need. So the question is, 
is what is the, what are the developments in radar and processing such that uh, autonomous autonomous vehicles become safer? Yeah, um, good question. It's a, you know, a, a technical one. Maybe I don't have time to, to cover that um, completely or, or maybe not have all the answers, but it's increasing quickly with time. Um, with the development in these, in these types of technology is increasing. A lot of money going into the companies who are developing those. They are bringing the cost down of, of LiDAR and radar and other technologies as the, as the demand builds up. And that will improve over time. But yeah, you're right. It's, that there is, there's a challenge today with, with the capabilities of the, of the software and the hardware that is, that is being used and is, and is available to use. But we'll see that, we'll see that increase as we get more more sensors and the, and the cost of sensors coming down, more sensors built into the vehicles, and, and that will increase over time. Okay, thank you, Ray. Thank you very much.